言论自由。Hi, I'm Katie Engelhart, and I'm Brian Pellet. Welcome back to On Free Speech, our monthly podcast from FreeSpeechDebate.com. What a lineup we've got for you this month! FSD brought in Ershad Manji, writer, radical, feminist, and self-described reformist Muslim, to talk about how not to talk about Islam. We also sat down with Rebecca McKinnon, author of the new book Consent of the Networked. She says it's time we, as netizens, took back the internet. So often, when we talk about free speech, we're referring to just that. Speech, words. This month, we wanted to take a different angle. We'll be looking at a variety of artists who have painted, danced, written, and laughed their way into conflicts over free expression. You'll hear my interview with Nick Sturdy, a freelance filmmaker and journalist who's documented the radical Russian art collective Vina. And mine with Tom Greaves, a stand-up comedian who, in his former life, was a speechwriter for London Mayor Boris Johnson. Katie will go head to head with FSD team member Manav Bhushan over a case study they wrote together on hunger strikes as free expression. But first, Irshad Manji, author of the new book Allah, Liberty, and Love. Manji has long courted controversy by promoting what some call a radical form of Islam. She advocates an overhaul of Islamic practice, one that questions dogma and embraces a diversity of ideas and identities. Manji addressed a full room at Oxford University. One of her main contentions was that Muslims often stifle debate about religion by quote using "respect me" as a euphemism for "don't challenge me." I believe that when we avoid asking each other pointed, searching, and uncomfortable questions, we at least implicitly wind up infantilizing one another. That, to me, is not respect. That is disrespect. It's also dishonest diversity. Manji founded the Moral Courage Project at New York University to teach people about Islamic reform. She's long been the target of vitriol from fellow Muslims. Her response to this is usually unconventional, as was the case when she called for death threats made against her on YouTube to be reposted after the company took them down. This is something quite radical. Manji was allowing for quite real and quite angry death threats against her to be broadcast to the world. We asked Manji, "Is there no speech you would prohibit by law?" Correct. I would not ban the publication of such things. She went on to explain why. By deleting the roughest edges of this debate, we become, in many ways, willfully blind to all that is involved in fighting for individual liberty and freedom of expression, and universal human rights, and pluralism of peaceful ideas. Several members of the audience press Manji on this point. Don't words themselves have the power to incite hate and violence? She seemed to skirt around the issue. Much of Manji's talk focused on women's place in Islam. For Manji, more of the debate about the so-called Ground Zero Mosque in New York should have addressed how women would worship there. One of the questions I've asked about that particular project, the so-called Ground Zero Mosque, is: Will there be segregation between women and men in the mosque at any time of the day or night? If so. Then I already know that what is being practiced there is not the most modern, the most progressive and democratic form of Islam you can imagine. No, what is being practiced there in the case of segregation is tribal culture. Now here's Brian speaking to Nick Sturdy, who's documented Voyna's guerrilla street art across Russia. Thanks so much for being with us, Nick. Why don't you start off by telling us about how you came to know Voyna, and then also some of their most controversial activities? A friend of mine who works for the BBC, Lucy Ash, met Voyna in 2010 and did a report for BBC Radio Four about them. By the time it came out, they'd been arrested or two had been arrested and were in jail. Banksy heard Lucy's report and sold a bunch of prints and raised eighty thousand pounds, which I managed to get to Vienna, and that's how I met them. They're most famous for this action in two thousand and ten of painting a sixty-three meter long phallus on a bridge that rises up above the security forces building in St Petersburg, and they also have done various other actions like overturning police cars, burning a, a police truck more recently, stealing chickens from supermarkets. They also projected a skull and crossbones on the Russian parliamentary building. So, so stealing chickens, overturning police cars—it seems like they're breaking everyday laws. 
They've been charged for aggravated hooliganism and incitement against a social group. I mean, that social group was the police, but still. Do you think that there should be any protection for illegal acts that are constituted as art under the eyes of the law? I think that different countries provide different contexts. And Weiner quite deliberately manipulate the fact that people will protect their right to freedom of expression to the hilt. They feel that in the environment of Russia where they have to fight against a state which is not willing, in their view, to listen to them if they perform only legally, they feel that they're justified. So I think that using, suddenly using violence and also breaking the law are problematic, but for people who want to bring about change, then these are things that they have to do. Well, let's go back to this 63-meter phallus on a St. Petersburg bridge. Vina actually won an award from the Russian Ministry of Culture for innovation for this. Help me wrap my mind around that. This illegal act, they've been arrested in the past, and then they win this award. The, I mean, the act itself was fantastically low-tech, and it was brilliantly executed, and it was a roll two fingers up to the establishment, which went down extremely well in Russia. And I think that their winning the state prize was a way in which many in the artistic establishment in Russia were able as well to express their dissatisfaction with the state. And there were many people involved in the committee who certainly didn't represent the state and who have been fighting for freedom of artistic expression in Russia for over a decade. Interesting. There's been some debate outside of Russia, even in the art world, about whether Vina's actions constitute art. What do you think about that? Does it constitute art? Well, I think there are lots of answers to that. One answer is that it doesn't matter. And whether it's art or not art, it can sometimes constitute dancing on the end of a pin. But I think that it is art. It functions in the realm of signification that their attack on the Russian state is not taking out the the tactical arms of the Russian state. It's not war. It's undermining the image of the Russian state. So Vina is not the only group that's actually raising eyebrows in Russia right now. There's a feminist punk rock collective called Pussy Riot that have been causing controversy all throughout the country. Is this an exceptional time for political art in Russia? What's what's going on? I mean, it is an exceptional time for, for political art in Russia. And I think that <clears throat> that in the absence of, of democratic institutions, in the absence of meaningful elections and so on, and in an environment where the police are very, very powerful, there's lots of corruption, and there are a few ways that people can actually engage with that, then art is becoming a very important weapon. So religion has a very sensitive place in Russia, and especially within the art world. There have been banned art exhibitions featuring religious pieces, Pussy Riot performed in a church. Uh, What do you think about this idea of mixing art and religion and some of the criminal penalties that have come out of it? Well, I think that some of the criminal penalties that come out of it reflect the way in which the Russian state is trying to identify itself with Christianity, with orthodoxy. So part of it, I think, is politics. The religious issue is is important because on on the one hand, the state is trying to use religion as a form of legitimising itself and of creating a, a narrative of who Russia is. It is also a legitimate target for artists and for people who, you know who, who want to express themselves freely the sentences that are being that people are threatened with can be up to seven years in practice it's very rare and very hard for these charges to stick now playing us out is pussy riot with their song holy mother kick putin out the band performed the so-called punk prayer at a moscow cathedral in february in condemnation of the church's close ties to putin <laughs> From offline to online activism, Rebecca McKinnon, co-founder of Global Voices, joined us in Oxford for the launch of her book, Consent of the Networked. She opened her discussion with a case study, the Arab Spring, and the role Western companies have played in it. McKinnon explained that some of these companies provided the censorship and surveillance technologies that helped bolster oppressive regimes. She cited revelations made by Moez Chakchuk, head of Tunisia's internet agency, as just one example. He announced this past fall that his agency under Ben Ali had been testing censorship technology on behalf of Western companies who provided it, and then, you know, enabling them to fine-tune it before they went and marketed it around the region. 
In the same way that Arab countries are at a pivotal moment, McKinnon believes the internet is at a Magna Carta moment, a time for netizens to fight for their online rights before they're lost to government and internet companies. Whether the internet is going to ultimately be liberating, whether it's ultimately going to be more enslaving or, or harnessed by uh, powerful entities, really depends on the extent to which we all get involved in the internet as a politically contested space. As the old adage goes, in democracies at least, we get the government we deserve, we're going to get the internet we deserve. McKinnon said, netizens should behave more like constituents who hold those in power accountable. The question is how do we evolve further from consent of the government around the nation state to consent of the network in a more global sense. But she offered no concrete solutions on how to achieve this. Now here's Katie speaking to Tom Greaves, a stand-up comedian who's also a card-carrying member of the UK Conservative Party. I wanted to start fairly generally. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word parody was first used in 1598 when the writer Ben Johnson defined it as, quote, to make it absurder than it was. I'm wondering what parody means to you. Perhaps inconveniently, that sounds like a pretty much perfect definition. <laughs> so in recent years, the UK has come under a fair amount of fire for its stringent take on intellectual property and copyright laws. As it stands, a comedian like yourself, who parodies a work without the permission of the original author, risks being taken to court for copyright infringement. Other countries have exceptions for parody, caricature, pastiche, whatever you want to call it. But my first question is, is this a free speech issue? Yeah, I guess it is a free speech issue, but actually inherent in speech really being free is intellectual property. Actually, it's an infringement of free speech if people can take bits of your work without credit and copy them. So in a way, I think it's sort of somehow circular. And intellectual property is terribly important. I mean, it's terribly important in comedy, particularly these days. It used to be in the past that jokes were treated sort of like folk songs, really, and they belong to everybody and you kind of put your own stamp on it. And I suppose really the alternative comedy scene of the 80s changed that and people started thinking, no, actually if I've written something, it's mine and not everyone should get to use it. But then of course parody is absolutely essential as well for satirists and, and for all of us. I guess we, we like to take the mickey out of people and assert things as if they're true. But of course, when you're doing that, the, the underpinning is meant to be that actually it's apparent to everybody that it's not true. And otherwise, then, I guess you are in danger of slandering or libeling someone. Well, we can kind of accept that to parody something, we need to borrow a little bit from it. Where would you draw the line between using a bit of something fairly and right. copying it outright or, or, or copying too much of it? I mean, the reason this is such a fascinating discussion is because that line can't be drawn very readily. And I guess you are now getting into a grey area. Maybe the best definition is is going to be sort of paraphrasing what people famously say about pornography, which is you know it when you see it, but it's impossible to define. There have been occasions I can think of where that has been a problem. I remember seeing a documentary about Michael Howard, the former leader of the Conservative Party, and they showed him a clip of Rory Bremner doing an impression of him. And Michael Howard, I think genuinely, was chuckling away throughout that skit. And then at the end of it, Rory Bremner, as Michael Howard said, so in conclusion, less tax, less blacks. And Michael Howard's face suddenly just went absolutely ashen and probably not just because of the grammatical error but uh, more seriously because he said completely reasonably actually that's a grotesque misrepresentation of what I believe and what we're advocating. Well you're you're bridging into this area of libel and slander. Yeah. I mean in your opinion are there topics that should be spared the comedian's tongue that should be considered sacred ground? That they don't touch at all. Right. No I think... There is a difference between joking about racism and a racist joke, for example. Though the short answer is that no, there shouldn't be anything that they don't touch. So I wouldn't want to say anything that would upset someone who doesn't deserve to be upset. Uh, I mean, there's no right not to be offended. And I think, you know, artistic integrity is important, but it's only it's one of a piece of things. And not hurting people is, is also important. Well, one of the reasons we were interested in sitting down with you is because you have this sort of foot in politics right. and, and foot in comedy. Have you ever rubbed up against intellectual property law or copyright infringement in, in your own jokes? No, I, ha I haven't. Well, never deliberately, actually, that there was something. I realised that a joke I'd been telling was a Spike Milligan joke, and I hadn't been doing it deliberately. 
So it was always very important to me when I was actually doing stand-up not to do other people's stuff, for it all to be me. And in fact, I wouldn't even want to use something someone had written specifically for me. Because actually for me, it's all about self-expression and it is a kind of outlet. Well, as I said before, um, the situation in the UK is fairly complicated. Last year, Professor Ian Hargrave submitted a commissioned report on intellectual property to the UK government. He recommended making it easier for work to be parodied. Other countries already have these kinds of exceptions. Do you think that these very strict laws in the UK are making the country less funny? Well, uh, what's interesting is that I, I wasn't aware that they were considered strict. And I wonder who currently is being held back from, from parodying things. People parody endlessly on television programmes. So it's really interesting that that's considered a problem. I wonder what arena it is an issue, because I think in practice we kind of muddle along reasonably well. So if you could change anything about laws concerning parody or, or satire as they stand, would there be anything that you'd change? I suppose the main thing that concerns me, I would like on satirical TV shows, on public service TV stations, for there to be more of a balance politically. I think they all come from a certain viewpoint. You mean a, a liberal viewpoint? I mean a liberal left viewpoint, yeah. And I think that's problematic. A, because I'm not a liberal lefty, but actually more importantly, because I think they do give an impression there's a sort of, not just to receive wisdom, but that there is a basic truth from which they start, whereas actually they're very subjective. And also I think it'd be funny, I mean, that's that, that's the more important thing. You had someone kind of curmudgeonly and conservative on saying things from a completely different, you know, from right field rather than from left field, then I think uh, it would be more interesting. Do you think conservatives have mastered parody in the same way that liberals have? No, I don't think anyone's mastered parody. I guess some people like Boris have mastered self-parody, but that's a bit different, isn't it? Okay, well, my last question, broadening out again, do you have any jokes that you think <laughs> listeners of the On Free Speech podcast would particularly enjoy? Now you're putting me really on the spot. <laughs> no. I could tell you this Mike Milligan joke. It's not mine. But he, um, he would come on stage and say, um, I have the body of an athlete. Pause in my fridge which um, I thought was quite a nice gag because I looked the way I do it worked quite well but of course it was his so I had to drop that yeah sorry I'm hopeless you've just um, that probably ended my comedy career but there we go. <laughs> I'm sorry thank you so much <laughs> thanks Tom. for having me that was really great <laughs> That was Nitin Dewar's song, Jan Lok Pal, which has become one of the anthems for India's anti-graft movement. The campaign made headlines last year when Anna Hazare, a veteran social activist, went on a hunger strike to pressure the Indian government to enact anti-corruption legislation. Now in the studio with us is FSD team member Manav Bhushan, who, along with Katie, wrote a case study on whether hunger strikes are a legitimate form of free expression. Manav, why don't you start off by telling us about the case? So, Anna Hazare had gone on a fast in Delhi in April at Jantar Mandir, which was the first large-scale movement for this bill. And in April, the government had ended that fast by promising a joint drafting committee. The talks broke down, and in August, Anna Hazare decided to go on another fast to press for the enactment of the bill which he and his team members had drafted. And this is what prompted the Indian government to take action against him and to arrest him in order to prevent the farce before it began. So what, what did you think about that arrest? Was it warranted? Well, the arrest itself came even before Anna Hazari had actually reached the venue of the farce. And the laws which were cited for his arrest were the apprehension of breach of peace and tranquility of an area and the arrest to prevent the commission of a cognizable offence. But Anna Hazari had clearly stated that he had absolutely no intention of causing any kind of unrest or any kind of disruption of peace. He'd even said there would be no disruption of traffic. So there was actually no reason for the government to move to arrest him. So the entire objective of the government was to nullify the effect of this anti-corruption campaign. And there was actually no legal or moral pretext under which he could have been arrested before he actually began that fast. So Katie, I understand from the case study that you and Manav disagree on the legitimacy of hunger strikes as free expression. What are your thoughts? Well, I first want to pick up on Manav's last point, which is the legal point. The Indian Penal Code makes attempted suicide illegal. And I think it's quite clear that a hunger strike, which could conceivably result in death, might fall under that heading. And in that case, the state 
had a responsibility to protect Hazar's life. Whether or not the government should have intervened before he began his hunger strike is unclear, but I think that it's possible they had the legal justification to do that. But I think there's also a broader point here, and that's about democracy and the way that it functions. In this case, Hazar's cause, anti-corruption, had widespread legitimacy in India, but I'm wondering what the case would have been like if his cause had been more controversial. I really think in this instance it would have seemed less heroic for Hazar to single-handedly force the government to act in this way. I'm in complete agreement that we shouldn't just look at the technical legal aspects and what is important is the larger picture. In this case, it's basically about politics and you're absolutely right that in a democracy these tactics can become uh, used as blackmail. Anna Hazare is not the first person who's gone on a hunger strike. There have been many, many before him. In fact, at Jantar Mantar, where he went on his first hunger strike, if you go there on any day, there are two, three people sitting on a hunger strike for different causes. And most of them do not get any attention from the government. The causes that they espouse appeal to such a narrow spectrum of society that they don't have enough mass support for the government to give a damn. But Hazare here had the support of at least hundreds of thousands of people which sent the government the signal that if they don't respond to it, they will have to face electoral repercussions. I think that's another point we need to focus on, is that Hazar was asking for a public space to stage his demonstration. And I'm not sure about the legal his legal standing in India, but I think it's possible the government had a right to deny him that public space. Then again, there is sort of a contradiction that's inherent in my argument. There is a difference between a public figure going on hunger strike and an ordinary citizen, sort of in a more private context. But sometimes these public citizens can become you know, very celebrated figures after they're dead. If we look at Tunisia, for example, there was a street vendor who set himself on fire and that sparked the Arab Spring, a lot of people would say. Do you think self-immolation falls into the same category of protected speech? I would say self-immolation is in many ways similar to a hunger strike, but I suppose the difference is that it's, it's a societal difference, that it, immolation is much more violent and does that just mean it's more effective? I mean, what do you think, Katie? So for me, this is sort of a technical question. I really think we can't separate the right to starve oneself and the right to set oneself on fire from, say, a country's laws on suicide. The government has a responsibility in certain societies to step in and prevent a suicide attempt. But I think it's more than that. We have to think, say, about laws on inheritance. So these sort of legal questions need to be addressed before we broadly state that hunger strikes and self-immolation should be allowed as forms of free expression. So I googled hunger strike this morning, and there's news events from people on hunger strikes in Belarus, Serbia, Pakistan, Israel. The list keeps going on. Are people doing this because they think it's effective? Well, I think it's more a sign of desperation because you I don't think people would choose to go on a hunger strike if there is a more effective and easier method at hand. And it's also excruciatingly personal. I mean, a hunger strike at its sort of most perfect form will only affect the person going on strike. I agree that probably desperation has a lot to do with it, but I think we should be wary of sort of reifying these forms of protest that, that really hijack the democratic process. Stepping back from the site for a moment, Brian, what's this month's free speech indicator? 12. That's how many countries made Reporters Without Borders enemies of the internet list this year, including newcomers Belarus and Bahrain. 14 additional countries, including France and Australia, were placed under surveillance. You can read more about each country that made the list on our team blog at freespeechdebate.com. Next month, Free Speech Debate Directors Timothy Garten-Ash will be discussing our project with intellectuals, journalists, and writers in Istanbul, Hong Kong, and Beijing. You can check out our site for the latest interviews, case studies, and events. If you've got ideas for the podcast,